we would like to understand if there is any scientific proof for rebirth because a lot of the spirituality is centered around the concept of rebirth okay so is there any scientific proof for the idea of rebirth well first of all we have to understand what science can prove and what science can't prove if i ask you does your mother love you you will say yeah of course most people will say yeah they will consider offensive question how, how can you say my mother doesn't love me but then i ask next question can you scientifically prove to me that your mother loves you well, how are we going to do that maybe are we going to check the chemical neurochemical levels in the brain when we approach our mother uh, we could say that yeah certain chemicals are secreted in the brain when uh, may say uh, the mother is hugging her newborn baby but love is much more than that so there are many realities in this world which are beyond the scope of science that does not necessarily mean that those realities are not real and that doesn't mean that they cannot be at all known by science but proof in terms of mathematical or empirical proof that is difficult for many realities say if somebody is a somebody is a hypochondriac they are pretending to be sick now somebody says that oh i have pain in my back and doctor say actually you have no pain in your back now can the doctor prove that you have no pain in your back doctor say i see in the x ray there is no pain but this patient say i am having pain so pain is a reality we have all experienced it but can we measure pain now we have a thermometer we have a oximeter we can't have a painometer isn't it uh, so uh, again we, we don't have a loveometer isn't it to measure love so there are many realities that are beyond the scope of science but this doesn't mean there is no no there is no logical evidence there is no inferential process by which you can find out about it but basically at the start of the age of science science divided reality into what it called as primary qualities and secondary qualities and primary qualities are those which are measurable so length breadth velocity viscosity luminosity all these science deemed as primary qualities they were measurable they could be put in terms of mathematical equations and that became the focus of science and secondary qualities now when i talk about love when i talk about pain these are not measurable they are real but not measurable so that which is secondary in the analysis of science is not very directly provable indirectly it is possible so similarly with respect to spiritual realities like the soul or rebirth or any higher spiritual reality like that they are not scientifically provable in the sense that it is not that those re- that is a limitation of those realities rather it is a limitation of the method of science because these science considers them secondary realities now so this applies as a general principle to any higher spiritual reality that we are talking about now having said that how can we talk about the idea of rebirth well first of all we have to look at is there something that is reborn so we could look at it from three broad perspectives that if i consider the person over here and a person over here at a different place and time and now if something about that person from here has come over here so how would we know about it the first is that this person's personality their consciousness their essence can it exist beyond the body is there something which is is the essence of the person separate from the body that is the first question and the second could be that is that essence of the person capable of existing separate from the body and then third is whether it can move from one body to another body so with respect to the first point now if you consider so i am in one sense combining the what you could call as scientific evidence for the existence of the soul with the existence of rebirth because you cannot talk about rebirth without having something that is reborn and that is called in the gita as the atma which in english is often translated as the soul so now the existence of the atma of consciousness can be inferred 
from its symptoms and the primary symptom is consciousness. Now consciousness is one of the biggest mysteries in science today. Like uh, on its 120th anniversary, the journal Science had published a list of 125 questions that science has not been able to answer. The first question was, where does the universe come from? And the second question was, where does consciousness come from? So this is a top unanswered question even in the domain of science. Now, science says that consciousness comes from the brain. That is the mainstream idea right now. However, there is nothing in the brain that is biologically different from the rest of the body. It is all ultimately cells and it's atoms and molecules. And functionally or structurally speaking, the brain is essentially made of the same fundamental elements as this table. Now, this table doesn't have consciousness. We have consciousness. So, consciousness in terms of the capacity to experience matter. That is a great mystery in science. So, how does matter develop the capacity to experience matter? Say, a gulab jamun is matter. My tongue is matter. Now, if the gulab jamun comes and is kept on this desk, kept on this table, there is no experience of anything. But if the gulab jamun comes on my tongue, there is some experience. It is delicious. So, how does matter develop the capacity to experience matter? So, it is not matter that is experiencing matter. There is something beyond that. So, how do we know that something beyond is there? There are many ways. First is that that matter, we could, or rather we can say matter bereft of consciousness, that basically goes through a few changes. There it is created, it deteriorates, and it is destroyed. Just saying we are in this house right now. This house was built. Over a period of time, it will deteriorate. It will eventually be destroyed. However, matter that has consciousness present within it, it doesn't go through three, but it goes through six changes. There is it's, there is beginning creation, we can call it birth, and after that there is growth. We can have extraordinarily fast computers or phones or robots, but none of them grow on their own. They just exist as they are. There is, there is birth, and there is create, growth, then there is maintenance. If my hand is cut, the hand has an innate capacity to heal itself. If the phone, if I, the phone may be the high, most expensive phone in the world is something like a fifty thousand dollars or something. Now, if that falls, it's not going to heal itself on its own. It's not going to repair itself on its own. So maintenance. And third is reproduction. So when consciousness is present in matter, that tends to reproduce itself. Again. My ordinary matter does not. And then beyond that, of course, there is deterioration and then there is destruction. So, these three additional features, growth, maintenance, reproduction, these, where, how does matter acquire the properties for doing this? Uh, the capacities for doing this? That's a big unanswered mystery. So, from a subjective perspective, there is the experience of consciousness, which we all have. So I experience happiness, distress. So when in the age of computers started growing, one of the biggest events in the growth of artificial intelligence was the computer Deep Blue defeating Gary Kasparov. Now it's written that computers can defeat players, chess players. But still, at that time, the player Kasparov was devastated. But Deep Blue didn't experience anything. The creators of Deep Blue were delighted. So, Deep Blue didn't even know it had won. It might have written, oh, I have won, you are lost. But it was just processing numbers. So, even the more, so the point I am making over here is matter does not experience matter, no matter what happens. So, the capacity to experience matter comes from something beyond. And that something beyond is what is called as the Atma. So, there is a, there is a personal, first person experience in terms of our consciousness. And there is an objective perception in terms of the three extra changes. So that is the first point that some the essence of a person is separate from their biology, from their body. Then can this essence exist separate from the body? For to pointing toward that are near-death experiences. There are cases of people who, when they meet some heart accident or they have a heart attack, at that time 
they uh, they suddenly feel as if they have come out of their body and they are observing themselves from above the body. I have written a book called Demystifying Reincarnation that I have analyzed this elaborately. So there is a case of this uh, Pamela Anderson, so it is one of the most uh, remarkable cases of near the experience. So in this case, she had an aneurysm at the bottom of her brain and the doctor told her it was almost inoperable unless they have to do a very daring operation called operation standstill where they induce an artificial heart attack in the body so the heart stops pumping blood then they put the patient in a coma like state uncon completely unconscious state and then when the heart is stopped pumping blood then they drain all the blood out of the brain they open the skull and they take the brain out of the cranial cavity and then they operate at the bottom. So in this case, it is essential that the person be completely unconscious. So to make sure that the person is unconscious, they have, they have earphones around the person's ears which are emitting high sound like the whistles of a train at a high sound, high frequency. So if the brain is non-responsive to those that level of sound. That is when it is understood that the person is actually unconscious. Means unresponsive means the person is of course unconscious, but the brain is also not responding showing any signals on any devices. So in such a situation, the person is medically completely documented to be unconscious. And yet, when she came back to consciousness and she recovered, she described uh, seeing herself from above. And the first thing he noticed is that, that her hair had been cut in a very peculiar way. He said, why is my hair cut like that? And then she knew she had to have brain surgery, but she saw the doctors operating near her groin area. What is going on over here? Asking. So what the doctors are doing, they were creating arrangement for a bypass when they were giving an artificial heart attack. That is why they had put a, a tube like structure from there. And then she heard the main brain surgeon talking with the Assistant, he says, the assistant was a female, she was telling, you know, the veins are very thin over here. Then the doctor said that, try from the other side. And she reported the conversation between the two of them. So now, how does this conversation come about? How could, how, how could she know about this? Now, she was medically, from the medical record itself, from the devices, she was completely unconscious. So how was she conscious when she was unconscious? That suggests that the source of consciousness is separate from the body and separate from the body, separate from the brain. So that is uh, an indication that consciousness can exist beyond the brain, beyond the body. So consciousness is separate from the body, consciousness can exist separate from the body is indicated by near the experiences. And then we can go to past life memories. Dr. Ian Stevenson was a pioneer and apart from him, or uh, Many other researchers have also done significant research in this area where they have found people exhibit remarkably accurate recollections of their past lives. Now, Stevenson focused primarily on children and he focused on spontaneous recollections of past lives. To, to, why spontaneous? Because sometimes people can be hypnotically induced to go into past life regression and by that also they may remember past lives. But in hypnosis, now what is a recollection and what is a suggestion? Now that is difficult to discern sometimes. That is why he focused on spontaneous, not hypnotically induced. And children may sometimes have a fanciful imagination and they may tell stories. But children are not capable of making elaborate frauds. So he wanted to make sure that there was as much authenticity as possible in the testimony and he found four parallel lines of evidence. First was of course recollections. There are thousands of children who remember vivid details of their past lives. I was so and so at this place, I was this, I was that. So many kids tell their parents, you know, I am small now but I was big earlier. Most of us say I was small earlier, now I am big. That is what we remember when we grow older. Beyond that, they may tell the name of the police, the, the name of the pa parents or family members. So that's, that's recollections. But it's not just recollections. 
after that there are recognitions recognitions means that this person is taken to the previous place there they recognize the the place the objects the people and markings on the houses and it's it's uh, now these recollections of uh, recognitions that are done so stevenson himself was he tried to apply the scientific rigor to the study so he tried to ensure that this meeting would happen in the presence of a objective third person researcher because if the two families meet then they may exchange notes and they may come together and they make a fraud but he tried to ensure that this first meeting between the two people would happen in the presence of a third person and in those cases he considered much stronger than others and there are many cases like that and there's not only recollections and recognitions but there are also behaviors so there are kids so for example there was one story in turkey of one nasip ul taskiran so this nasip as a small boy would say that my name is nasip said, yeah your name is nasip and he says that his name was his name his name was nasip budak but he said i am actually nasip ul taskiran says no no nasip budak then his parents had to understand that actually he is claiming to be a uh, somebody else and this person later on they found his parents didn't pay any attention especially because they they belong to a religion which does not believe in reincarnation so they neglected him but he kept insisting and at the age of 6 he said if you don't take me there i'll myself go alone and find my family he said i have a wife i have children 6 year old boy saying this then his grandfather had got married recently remarried to a woman from that town and when she heard the story hey i know i think i know this person is and his grandfather got interested and they took him to there so when he went there he had never been in that town and this is all in the pre internet age so it's not that kid that so research and found some information new thing he took them to that place and when he went there there was actually a widow and she had been married to a person named nasip and he had and she had two kids and his nasip and he saw these these kids were now older than him but he was fondling their hair and treating them as if they were his children and on top of that he was also when he saw his widow, the widows she had remarried now and he saw her picture with her present husband he got he went into such a jealous rage he said you are my wife not anyone else's wife the small child he went there and tore off her picture and he treated her just like she was his wife initially she was skeptical but then she told that she uh, that he told that she is my wife he and then they were not ready to believe it this is the researcher was observing this so he said not ready to believe it and she said that you know once i had got drunk and when i was drunk i had got angry with her and i tried to attack her so she had dodged the attack but the knife had grazed her inner thigh and there was a scar on her inner thigh now so the researchers uh, the the female researcher went with her privately and she examined her thigh which found there was a mark now how would a boy who has never met a woman living in another city know that she has a scar near in a private part of her body so this is this is behavior and this is a third line of evidence and fourth is there is there are not just behaviors but birth marks and birth defects so his nasip nasip case is very remarkable about this because in his case he basically in his previous life he had got into a drunken brawl with someone and that person had stabbed him multiple times and he had died iraq so nasip whenever he would remember his life his pre, he would talk about his previous life he would point to various parts of his body and he had seven birthmarks now some people have some swellings some scars these are birthmarks kind of birthmarks so he had seven birthmarks on different parts of his body and these correlated exactly in terms of location with the fatal wounds that had killed nasip in his previous life so so it's stevenson stevenson the last book he wrote was called as where reincarnation and biology intersect and he found scores of cases of this correlation between fatal wounds in the previous life and birth marks or birth defects in this life so this he considers as remarkable evidence because his body there is empirically observable transformation and many of these cases were 
murder murderous uh, the deaths happened by murders or accidents so there was post mortem available so in that sense the evidence is also quite clear what were the location of the fatal wound in the previous life and what are the birthmarks in this life so through all these the recollections recognitions behaviors and birthmarks birth defects this can be these are very persuasive uh, multi multiple lines of converging evidence that make a strong case for rebirth